there was a very interesting account of when Justice Rehnquist was nominated to become Chief Justice Rehnquist uh, uh, of the Supreme Court, and it was discovered that he had a title on a property in Arizona uh, uh, restricting any uh, Mexicans from owning, uh, as far as the Chief Justice Rehnquist says, I, I, I didn't know about this, I didn't put it in there, they're not enforceable. And while he was sort of defending himself against that, there was an, it was also discovered that he, he had a property his vacation home in, uh, the, uh, in New England restricted anyone of the Hebrew race, I think was the language, from owning property. And, and as he's on the defensive, and, and it, it's going through the Senate confirmation hearing, at the time, and interestingly enough, headed by Joe Biden, uh, uh, Joe Biden is pushing on this, and then it was discovered that Biden had these restrictive covenants in his property. That, they're just all over the place, and they stick. My name is Richard Brooks. I'm an economist and a lawyer. I, uh, I teach at NYU. What's sort of fascinating about the, the, the structure of property ownership and race in the U.S. is that um, in 1910, Baltimore became the first city to racially zone its neighborhoods. Uh, it uh, stipulated, it created a, a black neighborhoods and white neighborhoods. Um, it didn't force anyone to move, uh, um, which would have been a clear violation of, of the Constitution, the federal Constitution, uh, an appropriation. Uh, um, but what it did do was it said, when you sold your property, you had to sell to someone of the designated race for that community uh, and, and vice versa. So there was racial zoning and this sort of took off in the country for a while and there was this mutual restriction that not only uh, blacks couldn't buy in white neighborhoods and whites couldn't buy in black neighborhoods. That was to satisfy the then conventional framing set up by Plessy versus Ferguson, separate but equal. Uh, they're equally restricted. Um, and they are separate. Uh, so the, um, the Supreme Court ruled that unconstitutional in 1917. Uh, um, so basically it was a form of impermissible state action under the 14th Amendment. Uh, um, so for a government body to make these restrictions. Um, the, the court was quiet for a few years and then 10 years later it made it quite clear that there is no restriction on private actors deciding whether uh, uh, or not to discriminate uh, in terms of their selling of property. Uh, and then uh, these covenants just took off. These are agreements between private owners that they will not sell their property uh, or lease or rent to persons of designated races or nationalities or religion. Um, and so on. Now they had existed before. In fact, the earliest ones I've, I've come across were in California, uh, used against uh, Chinese um, immigrants that had, um, had, had migrated to California during uh, the sort of the expansion of the railways in the West. Um, but they were really all over the country. And what, what's intriguing about them is because they are private contractual agreements, there was no state action. And uh, in the theory, and, and therefore no problem with this going forward. In 1948, in a very famous case known as Shelley v. Kramer, uh, the Supreme Court ruled that yes, individuals can do this privately, have these agreements, but when they go to court to get them enforced, and the court and they're called on the court to act, that's state action. So it overturns racial restrictive covenants through this, this ruling, which, which was so, somewhat extraordinary because it kind of broke down the private-public distinction. There was a question of whether or not you can get an equitable remedy. There was a question whether Shelley just meant that the court could not act, but you might still be able to get damages. So there was a subsequent case in 1953 that said, no, not even in that case can you get this. So what was fascinating to me was that these covenants, lawyers continue to write these covenants in uh, their deeds. And I believe that these covenants continue to have impacts uh, following uh, the court ruling that their enforcement, either in courts of law or in courts of equity, were unconstitutional. <laughs> it's extraordinary. And, and the reason why, uh, and here's the, the, the real hint that made, made it clear to me that they were doing work. In 1969, 
decades after Shelley versus Kramer, uh, and also this Barrows v. Jackson case, the Department of Justice sends out to all of the major title companies in the country a cease and desist letter. They say to these companies, you have to stop reporting whether or not there's a covenant, uh, a racial restrictive covenant when you do property searches. They haven't been enforceable for decades. The then recently passed Fair Housing Act of 1968 also made them uh, 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 unenforceable. You have to stop reporting them. And the title companies were initially hesitant to do so. I spoke to uh, a former president of the American Land Title Association, uh, uh, and they said that they were worried that there still might be some liability if they didn't, because they were also ensuring that the reports were valid. So what's fascinating uh, for, uh, for, um, now is imagine that um, you are a, a bank. And let's, let's say you, you don't care at all. There's no racial animus at all. The bank just wants to make money. Let's also imagine that everyone in, uh, in the community has sort of renounced uh, sort of the, the racist practices in the past. Uh, but the bank is, is, isn't quite sure. Um, so the bank wants to lend Brooks uh, uh, money to buy property. Uh, let's say the property is worth $100,000 uh, in some neighborhood. And the bank is going to lend me $80,000. I have to put 20% down. The, uh, the title search gets done, and I also have to get insurance and all these other things. The title search gets conducted, and the bank realizes, oh, there was a, a racial restrictive covenant on this property, which has not been enforceable for decades. Uh, um, but, you know, the, uh, either the developer of the property or all of the neighborhoods got together, and they put this thing in place. So maybe that's a signal to the bank that when Brooks moves in, there might be white flight. And then when there's white flight, the property values will fall. And now the bank is perfectly willing to lend me 80% you know, of 100,000, but if the bank is anticipating some probability of flight and, and falling property values, maybe the bank says, no, I don't think I want to lend to you. Or maybe I'll only give you 50,000. So the way in which, even though the rules themselves are not, uh, again, remember everyone, <laughs> in this framework could have abandoned the racism of the past that led to this. But the publicity uh, that's, uh, and when, and when I say publicity, uh, if you know the neighborhood, you know the neighborhood. But if you're not interacting with the neighborhood, the way you learn about it is through these title searches. So when the title company does the search, the banks, the insurers, all of these other actors that are interacting with the property, they coordinate around the announcement of the, of the value of the title. Uh, or what the title might signal. Uh, and, and, and so for me, law is this, uh, one of the, its most uh, meaningful elements is the publicity. Uh, that law in some sense must be public and that publicity generates a kind of common knowledge. It, it can serve as a basis for correlated equilibria. And this is sort of the way, let's say the, the way the title companies were announcing certain expectations around uh, by the t producing the title reports uh, and keeping and these things staying in the in the registry of deeds, uh, uh, this public access to it allowed patterns to continue over time. Um, this most recent uh, project on forms of address really follows almost immediately from that. They're not just property. They're, we don't just have titles to property. We have titles to persons. So. Students may refer to me as Professor Brooks, or you may refer to someone as Mr. or, uh, or, or Madam. Or, and when we recognize these titles and we address persons, not just by the titles, but also by the styles associated with those titles, Sir, Madam, or, and so on, uh, those titles also, like the title companies, announce certain expectations of entitlements and obligations in an interaction. And it's, I think, what's, what's really interesting here, unlike a property deed, a title there, which is really hard to change and it takes a lot of work. Even now we know there's been a lot of discussion about how can we remove these, title, these, these restrictive covenants out of deeds. It's, uh, it's extremely costly to do. A lot of, many, some jurisdictions are trying to help to undo it. 
there was a very interesting account of when Chief Justice Rehnquist was nominated, uh, or Justice Rehnquist was nominated to become Chief Justice Rehnquist uh, uh, of the Supreme Court, and it was discovered that he had a title on a property in Arizona uh, uh, restricting any uh, Mexicans from owning, uh, as far as Chief Justice Rehnquist says, I, I, I didn't know about this, I didn't put it in there, they're not enforceable. And while he was sort of defending himself against that, there was an, it was also discovered that he, he had a property, in his vacation home in, uh, the, uh, in New England restricted anyone of the Hebrew race, I think it was the language, from owning property. And, and as he's on the defensive, and, and it, it's going through the Senate confirmation hearing, at the time, and interestingly enough, headed by Joe Biden. Uh, uh, Joe Biden is pushing on this. And then it was discovered that Biden had these restrictive covenants in his property. That, they're just all over the place and they stick. What's different about titles and forms of address and styles is the fluidity. I can refer to you as sir in one moment and by your first name in another moment. Someone else, a student may walk in and then I may call you professor. And the, this kind of fluidity allows a kind of adaptation and coordination that I think is just extraordinary. And I think it's really, it, it, I think it's difficult to overstate how much uh, just this tiny little uh, address, whether it's a reference or a form of address, is doing work in coordinating everyday interactions. Once we address someone, or what someone is addressed in a particular way, there, oh, there are these forces of complying with the expectations that are associated with that address. Uh, um, some of them are work uh, at the level of the individual who's being addressed and, and those who, are, who can hear it. Uh, and I refer to that as the constitutive. It kind of says who you are in any, in any moment. It, it constitutes you in some sense. You can reject it, you can resist it, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to uh, uh, endorse it personally, but it constitutes you in the eyes of others and potential, often sometimes in your own eyes. Uh, 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 um, there's a, uh, I have a chapter, one of the later chapters, where I make a, the, in the book, uh, I draw a distinction between swearing and cursing and other types of vile language. and, and uh, 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 Cursing in particular uh, has uh, uh, what uh, this, the great criminologist uh, Jack Katz uh, uh, um, talked about um, in his book, The Seductions of Crime. Uh, he has a chapter called Righteous Slaughters. Uh, uh, when Jack says that he, when you look at police reports, um, because so much violence is between intimates, uh, there, there is stranger violence, but there's a, a, a great amount of violence that occurs between intimates. And one thing that you, ca you see when you study this violence between intimates is that there's a lot of cursing. A lot of, uh, and it's not just random swear words. Uh, there's language that's kind of trying to transform the person. You piece of, you this, you know, like it's very transformative language. It's the kind of language you hear often uh, um, associated with claims of genocide, transforming people into rats and roaches. And, and what, what Jack says uh, is that it sort of justifies the oncoming slaughter. Because you now it's not just that they're this person with whom you might have been familiar, who, who might have been your neighbor for many years uh, in Rwanda, in Yugoslavia, this person gets transformed into something vile. And not, so not only does that break the familiarity, but it also justifies or makes the slaughter that's about to come righteous, and that's the righteous, righteous slaughter uh, uh, chapter. So there's a way in which, at some level, and how you address someone has this constitutive element, this constitutive aspect. Uh, uh, how you see them, it, it may transform how the audience, the bystanders see them. You call someone, uh, a, a sort of a, a, a name and it kind of makes everybody say, oh, well, this person deserves that or not. Again, it's just, it's just happening so subtly and so quickly. So that's the constitutive. And then there's the regulative uh, uh, function of address that it, it sort of says how you, sh instead of who you are and what you are, whether you are someone who is a citizen, whether you are someone with dignity, 
uh, it reduces you to an animal. That's the Rather than that, uh, the regulative tells you how you should behave. And, it, and it's announced not just to the person who's being addressed or referred to, but it's also the audience and also me. It tells us how are we going to behave in this way. And then finally, there's the correlative. Um, when we make this announcement, it'll, it allows you, the addressee or the, ref, the person who's being referred to and the bystanders and audience and the, and the, and the speaker, it allows us to sort of coordinate uh, and, or correlate our behaviors and our expectations together. So these three functions sort of get articulated and they kind of are uh, simultaneously uh, uh, at, at one moment. And I, I call them together the first law of address because you don't need external enforcers. Uh, you don't need a, a state enforcement machine uh, uh, or any kind of enforcement machine to get, get compliance with the address. So it's almost as if the announcement, the announced address calls forth its own enforcement uh, from the persons, from all of the persons at the, at, at the site of the address. Uh, and that's, uh, that's the first law of address. I was looking at the way in which boy was uh, used to refer to black men in the in the in the in the South, both in the antebellum period, or, or I, I should in, in very interesting ways. It looks like the usage "boy" in the South um, and in the U.S. Uh, may have taken off in this context after the 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 Civil War. Uh, it, 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 there's, a, there's a very provocative graph, uh, an engram, showing the usage slave versus boy, and they kind of, uh, 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 a slave falls dramatically after the Civil War, and boy takes off. Uh, this, is, this is kind of interesting. Uh, and uh, as I dug further, I realized that in ancient Greece and in Roman antiquity, boy was actually a reference for slave. It had nothing to do with American race. Uh, 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 boy was the sort of the, uh, even in early modern England, uh, or, or sort of post-medieval England, uh, uh, boy was how slaves were referred to. There were other terms used to describe sing, uh, sort of young, uh, young males. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Page, Swain. Uh, it wasn't until the 1300s that boy uh, first was used as a reference to young males. Long before that, in English and certainly in, uh, in ancient Greece and Rome, boy was a reference to slave. Uh, so th this, that this continues to track uh, the stays with uh, uh, um, in the practices um, in the U.S. or, uh, or you know, post bellum, even in the the, uh, 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 the 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 modern civil rights era, uh, when boy is spoken, uh, it's not an an effort to infantilize a, 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 a person. Uh, now, now, boy has many other nuances too. But in this particular way, it was not about trying to render someone a child. It was calling forth the expectations of uh, uh, entitlements and obligations that were more closely associated with slave. And that's how it had been for millennia. 